I'm the Reverend Kimberly Devis, and I welcome you to our service today. Together we'll sing a little, listen to some beautiful music, hear some poetry and sacred texts, and hopefully not be as annoyed with my homily as President Bartlett was annoyed with his priests. <laughs> and finally, the president finally gets to the message of this passage, be subject to one another. And then, of course, the show continues and the president moves on to other things. But I'm not sure I have ever really moved on from that opening scene because I sit with my minister hat on and I long for more. I mean, I'm not entirely sure I can tell you what else happens in that episode other than um, Alice and Janney delivering so beautifully the line, Melissa Markey died. Well, what does be subject to one another mean, I will? I mean, come on, Jed, don't come here with half a thing and not be able to, you know, after you've walked me to the brink and say you've got to do this, it's important. And I've been waiting 17 years for an answer. And none is coming directly from Sorkin and company, so I finally decided I had to write my own answer. Now let me be clear, this is not about being subservient. This is not about imbalance of power, or at least it shouldn't be. Rather, it is about attention. Simply being attentive to one another. We might talk about it as being kind. Now, I want to make a distinction. I do not mean nice. I hate that word, nice. Nice is wishy-washy, nice rolls over, nice buys into the gospel of comfort, a gospel that says we don't want to offend. Nice is complacent, nice doesn't make waves, doesn't make a stink, and lets people have their own version of the truth even when it isn't factual. Nice doesn't want to bother anybody. Nice says comfort is more important than goodness, ease, is more valued than doing what's right. Ugh. We are, however, supposed to be kind. Kindness sees a need and offers to help. Kindness stands up for the person being bullied and makes sure they're safe. Kindness disrupts lawless and lawlessness and incivility. Kindness goes out of its way. Kindness recycles. Kindness holds the door open. Kindness builds a ramp. Kindness explains. Kindness knows its privilege and uses it to build justice. We see this flavor of kindness throughout the West Wing. It's Charlie agreeing to be Anthony's big brother after Simon Donovan is killed. It's CJ giving Charlie a framed picture of him and his mother. It's Toby waiting for CJ after she talks to Hoynes about their one night stand. It's Leo making space for Toby's concerns about school prayer. It's President Bartlett giving Leo the napkin. It's candidate Bartlett going to the airport to be with Josh when his dad dies. It's Josh patiently, although sometimes impatiently, explaining policies to Donna and us. It's Donna. Donna meeting with a woman who is begging for her son's clemency. Donna sitting with journalist Billy Price's wife when he goes missing in the Congo. Donna bringing Josh water and calling Dr. Keyworth during the crash after a shooting. But it's more than just acts of kindness like that, because kindness is not easy. Kindness is sometimes uncomfortable because it requires us to not stay comfortable, not always stay nice. And kindness doesn't sit still. It acts in big and small ways. It calls elected representatives and writes letters and goes to protest marches and makes sure that everyone who wants to have a voice has one. Kindness knows better than to blame the victims and believes survivors of sexual harassment, sexual abuse, and sexual assault. 
kindness stands outside of Planned Parenthood and acts as protective escort to women seeking medical treatment. Kindness puts on angel's wings and shields a grieving family from a Westboro Baptist Church protest. Kindness sends water to Flint, Michigan and camps with the, with the Indian nations at Standing Rock. Kindness prays for the protection of sacred land and water and asks forgiveness. Kindness presses legislators to send aid to Puerto Rico. Kindness mourns the loss of another black person killed by police. And kindness works for racial justice because it knows that black lives matter. And imagine if we thought of ourselves that way and were kind to ourselves and saw ourselves with that inherent worth and dignity. This is how we become subject to one another when we live out this golden rule, all of it as reflected across the world's religions. And it's there. Here's what they have to say. The Jewish, Jewish sage Hillel said, what is hateful to you do not do to others. This is the whole of the law. The rest is commentary. In the Mahabharata, the divine Krishna declares, this is the sum of duty. Do nothing unto others which would cause your pain if done to you. In the Buddhist text of the Udana Varga, the student is urged, hurt not others in ways that you yourself would find hurtful. In the Muslim Hadith of Al Nawawi, the Prophet Muhammad teaches, no one of you, no one of you is a believer until he desires for his brother what he desires for himself. In the ancient wisdom of Shinto, there's a saying, the heart of the person before you is a mirror. See there your own form. The Ogala Lakota spiritual leader Black Elk wrote, all things are our relatives. What we do to everything we do to ourselves. And in the Gospel of Matthew and the Christian scriptures, Jesus says, whatever you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. This, this is what it means to be subject to one another. We are subject to one another when we stop building walls and start building bridges. We are subject to one another when we work for equal rights and equal pay and safety and clean water and accessibility for everyone, even for those we disagree with at the top of our voices. And we are subject to one another when we join our forces together, remembering what Margaret Mead taught us that President Bartlett makes um, Will Bailey repeat. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Be subject to one another, pleads President Bartlett and the writer of Ephesians, and every religious path worth its salt. We must notice each other's needs and seize the moment to act. We must be willing to be uncomfortable in service to something other than ourselves. We must give of ourselves out of love and affection and compassion. We can't stop to be nice and conciliatory or the dream will never be. We must answer the call of our principles and our morals and our ethics and our faith. We must be subject to one another. What happens when I, when I get a, an episode of, say, West Wing, is I'll watch the whole movie first. I'll get, a, I'll get what's called a dry cut, which is basically film with no effects and no music. It's just raw dialogue. It's not processed at all. And I'll sit down and watch it by myself, and then I'll go into what's called a spotting session. If, if this goes by, that, that's not going to be a test, so you don't have to worry about any of that. So, so I go to a spotting session where I sit with Aaron and Tommy, and, um, and we watch the film and decide where music should be and what it needs to accomplish. And I have a, a music editor with me who's taking detailed notes, so that by the time I walk out of that session, I've got detailed notes on 
on every place music starts and ends what what Aaron said so I can recall the session so then then my job is to really kind of go back and back to my little closet with the, my my video screen and my my guitar or in that case keyboards and just start to create music something that works inside the inside this inside the show now a lot of people approach that in a more technical way because you know they've been to school and they've learned theory and they've been taught how to compose and what I never learned any of that so only thing I ever knew to do was sit down and play until something happened I did a, uh, a show called 30 something and 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 the main main title there was a lot of stuff in that show called we called it begging for sex it was like <laughs> So, and it was it was a feel. It was kind of a, a general feel. So what I tried to do when we when I wrote the main title for that one was take a, a bit. <laughs> heard it that's kind of what it turned into and it was really just messing around with this kind of popping guitar stuff and that's that's really the way I, I approach it in that particular show there was a lot of wry humor and um, and fun that show was a lot of fun I mean there were dramatic moments and stuff too but but the fun part was was what I've kind of built all this <laughs> popping guitar off of and uh, I was really lucky. I borrowed an acoustic guitar to do that because I didn't own one, and uh, and I got really lucky with it. Right after that, I ended up with a show called The Wonder Years, which I promised I'd do this today, which was more like this. Every time Kevin C. Winnie. play this. Which is, uh, I kind of built that into being Winnie's thing. So I digress. Let me get back to, to, where, to where I really was. So I go to this spotting session and I come out with these notes and then I go to my room and I sit and watch the film and try to find a tempo or a color or a feeling that is right for the scene. It may be, uh, in case of the West Wing, I only used the guitar once uh, uh, in the West Wing. I used it um, for Leo going through the woods when he had his heart attack. Sell the acoustic guitar version? Yes. Yes. Pull out your iPhones and I'll do it for you all. It is pretty that way, isn't it?
you go. Hope you got it. You're welcome to it. I never really, never really did that till Mark made me do it. And I'm not a one-take wonder boy much anymore. You put six good composers in a room and show them all it's the same scene, and they're going to walk out with six different pieces of music. It's, there's no right or wrong. Well, there is a wrong. But, <laughs> but there's no specific right. You can write it a bunch of different ways and make a bunch of different choices, and, and they're all acceptable, and they all, they all will work. There's, um, I didn't do this, I don't have any film to do it with. Lots of times when I, when I play at film festivals, I'll bring some film with me, and I'll play the film with no music, and then I'll play the film with the wrong music. You know, imagine Leo walking through, you know, having his heart attack walking through the woods, and you hear. <laughs> Wouldn't be the same as some, you know. the episode and I'd be able to play it for you. Instead of... <laughs> I mean, it just would create a different, it, a different energy to it. And, uh, and so my job is really to, to find what best supports the scene. Sometimes what supports the scene best, the best music you can have is no music. Um, when you're down in trouble need a helping hand And nothing Nothing is going right So you got a song like that. Aaron didn't ever use that song, but uh, so I, I will approach it like in the beginning of my score sometimes. Uh, starting to move in the way that song moves. And so what I'm beginning to do is set up in people's minds so that when the song comes, you go, oh, of course. You know, and it's a, it's a form of, it's like a prequel. It's, and, and he would do that to me sometimes, and I'd have to figure out, well, how do I do this? And, and I'd have maybe, maybe if it's a CJ story, I'd have three or four different moments in the in the piece where I could just start to play a little bit of that theme, even three notes of it, and then just move on into some other score. Uh, where he really liked to do me in was songs like um, Brothers in Arms. And, and he wrote that into the script, and then they cut it, and then we got to the end, and the song kept going, and Aaron said, the song needs to end. I said, well, the song doesn't end. It's, you know, we can fade it out. And he said, no, it can't fade out. Why don't you make an ending for it? <laughs> True story. So I said, you want me to do what? You want me to be Mark Knopfler, you know? And he said, yes. So if you listen to that, that recording of it, it now has an ending of the song. So what happens is over the last 10 seconds of the song, I had to go in and duplicate the sound of Mark Knopfler's guitar and start playing Mark's, start playing guitar parts that Mark was playing and devise an ending so it actually stopped on the credits. And it, most people don't know, most people don't hear it because I spent hours and hours trying to match the sounds. We were working on the show and originally Aaron wanted a guitar show. I was doing sports night and Aaron said, you know, I'm gonna do this little political drama. Would you be interested in doing it? He said, I'm thinking it's Americana guitar. So I'm thinking, my, my, Miss America, you know. And uh, I said, sure, I'll do it. And then they, they shot the pilot in April. And they're starting to put the whole cut together. Got a pickup. And they're starting to put the whole cut together. And Aaron comes to me and says, well, listen, you know, we're putting this orchestral music up against it. And it's really working good. Do you, do you think you can do that? I didn't know if I could or not, but I said yes, of course, because uh, I was going to be out of work if I didn't say that. And so we got started on the show, and I got 
really involved. We didn't have a main title. At that time, Randy Newman was writing a main title for the show called Our House. Um, a couple other people were writing songs. It was, you know, everybody wanted to get on this Aaron Sorkin show. I just had my head down and I was working. And uh, in the last scene of the third episode, we were scoring them in batches of three at that time. So the first three, I wrote the pilot. I wrote half of the episode two and wrote two cues for episode three. And by the time I got to episode three, I had a, a scene, you all remember it, when Dulé, Charlie, shows up at the, at the Oval Office and they're doing the first taping from the Oval Office. And there's this theme in there that goes. <laughs> Tommy Shlami came over to my house just to preview some of the cues, and, and he listened to that cue, and he said, that's our theme. I said, really? <laughs> he said, yeah, that's our theme. Write it for a minute long. So what I did was, uh, that first scoring session, it wasn't orchestrated or ready to be done, so for the first or uh, orchestra session, there was no main title for the show. So we used a synth mock-up on episodes two, and I believe episode three, there's a synth version of the main title. It's not the, the orchestral one. If you ever go back and listen, it's, it's note for note, it's virtually identical, but it's played on synthesizers instead of on, a, with a real orchestra. You, you put them, you A-B them, and there's no, there's no comparison. The live musicians performing music is so much richer than playing it on a synth, you know. Uh, there's just no, that human touch and, and a, a room of 50 people trying to express one thing is so much more powerful than a really good sounding string patch. So if you ever get a chance, roll by it. Uh, it's not that different, but put them up next to each other and you'll really tell the difference. Uh, so it came out of that. It came out of that scene where, it, where we pull back and. And, and Charlie's watching the president, and he's doing a, a scene. So I pulled it out of that and played it for Aaron, too, and Aaron loved it. And my best story about the, the main title is I was playing it, uh, doing a rundown in the orchestra in the second session we did, which was for episodes four, five, and six. And uh, I had the orchestra running down. Now, Aaron knew the theme, but he'd never heard an orchestra play it. So he came in, and he was sitting behind me. And we did the first rundown, and it got to the end, you know. Uh, and it just hung there. And I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to get fired. And I, I, I turned around, and Aaron had a tear in his eye. And, and that's the way Aaron responded to music. Aaron was like, he was so intense about his words and so intense about the staging and everything about the piece. When it came to music, he was like a kid. He, if it moved him, it moved him. You're not supposed to ask that question. <laughs> because the purists here are going to say, I told you, I told you it was different. Yeah, it was different when John came on. But it was way more organized. <laughs> Truly, those, those, those dailies got out and I got my five days to score the show. And it was harder. I mean, you were going from somebody's voice to somebody trying to keep somebody's voice. And uh, it's, you know, it's, if it's not Aaron, it's not Aaron. I mean, it's, it's just he has a particular rhythm and tone and a feel. Uh, it was a little bumpy, those first four or five episodes because we weren't sure we were going to be able to make it work. And then it started to get into a rhythm of its own. And the characters, thank God for the actors, they kept it uh, pretty cohesive, although the stories really kind of changed a lot in, in fabric. It became more of a regular drama, I think, than um, Aaron's commentary and Aaron's take on, on how the big things in... in Politics really make a difference for the for people, and and he had that amazing ability to to bridge that gap, you know. 
As I write in the in the preface of the book, you know, I in college um, when I was first becoming politically active, I was a, a huge West Wing fan, and so. For me, when I uh, eventually found myself in the Obama White House, I found a lot of parallels between what I saw on TV and what I was living in real life. It was perhaps a little less glamorous, not so many walk and talks, um, more memos, um, <laughs> <laughs> longer hours. <laughs> but uh, but the, the sort of the, the essence of it was the same, right? You had um, obviously this sort of brilliant professor in chief. Uh, you had a, a sort of a cast of characters around him who worked for him, people who came from every walk of life who cared deeply about the work that they were doing. And so um, I think if you ask any of us, the thing that we missed the most about working in the White House was the people, uh, the amazing people we got to work with. And so I've been sort of mulling over, you know, what is the best way that we can capture that sense of the Obama White House? And then really what happened was after the election, um, it was actually a New Year's Eve party at Stephanie's house, and we were uh, in, the, in the kitchen having Manhattan's are old fashioned. Like old one fashioned. Of, there was bourbon. Um, These are important details. Yes, they're very important details. And, you know, kind of feeling a little mm, bad about the state of affairs, um, about the election and what had happened, and both a sense of nostalgia that we're about to lose something really special, um, and a little bit of apprehension, which has now turned into a lot of apprehension, <laughs> about what we were heading into. Um, and so Stephanie's best friend from college was there, and we, we got to talking, and I said, oh, what do you do? And she said, I'm a book agent. And I was like, oh, cool. And she said, do you have any great ideas for a book? And I'm like, nah. And my husband actually pitched her on the spot and said, actually, he's got this great idea about a collection of stories from the Obama White House. And she was like, oh, that's a great idea. I'm like, you're just it's just the bourbon talking. Um, but she followed up uh, and said, I really think that there's a, a market for this. I think there's interest. And so you should think about doing this. And so that led to this project. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we started thinking about who are the people whose stories we want to we want to lift up, um, and made a list of about 60 people, and then started working our way down the list. And everyone, Lynn, Steffi, uh, and let's see, 15 other people said yes. Um, and so that's what you have in front of you, or you don't have in front of you. Hopefully you do, but um, <laughs> you will when you buy it. Have in front of you uh, is this collection that really reflects, you know. Uh, a broad range of issues over eight years, events, um, everything from really, uh, I think, uh, happy stories about marriage equality, um, some of the behind the scenes around Obamacare and how that came to happen, and then some really hard stuff, a lot of disappointments, a lot of the personal things that people went through. Um, but again, it, it really reflects what those eight years were like. Stephanie, one of your proudest accomplishments was getting Sonia Sotomayor um, confirmed to the Supreme Court. <laughs> deserving of a applause, especially in this horrible week. Um, could you tell us a bit about what that was like and the challenges and, and how big a deal it was that you managed to achieve it? Well, I have been spending a lot of time reflecting on, uh, on that period <laughs> the last few weeks. Um, you know, I think it just really goes to show, I mean, when we were in it, and it was really hard, right? Like, there were moments where, even though it was the president's first Supreme Court pick, it was early in his term, we felt like we had the wind at our back, there were still a lot of headwinds we had to face. Congressional Republicans had said, you know, a few months prior that they were going to do everything they could to stop the president's agenda. They were holding up health care, they were holding up, you know, the economic recovery stuff we were trying to do, um, and they were going to make it really, really hard to confirm Justice Sotomayor. But you rewind back there, and I've been thinking about, like, what were, like, the hardest moments of that? It was, like, when they said that she had given that wise Latina speech um, and tried to rake her over the coals for that. And then we're raking her over the coals for having diabetes and, like, her personal health issues. I'm like, in stark contrast, that was, like, the worst that they could possibly come up with. <laughs> and, um, you know, to this day, and I really, I write my chapter about you know, what it meant to, one, meet her. And I talk about kind of meeting her for the first time. I'm from New Mexico. I'm, I'm uh, you know, a Latina who grew up on a border town who had, you know, very faced very similar kind of struggles to succeed in my academic life and in my professional life and kind of the parallels between her life and mine and how we had this kind of meeting at, um, in the White House at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue and what it took to get her through her confirmation um, and the criticism that she faced by Republicans who didn't even know how to say her name properly mm -hmm. um, to um, 
to you know the 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 mm -hmm. sweet you know um, success of when we did get her confirmed and what that felt like both for uh, for me as like a, a young Latina who saw her as a role model but also for our community broadly but for the country and what it really meant to have her voice um, somebody just so real who came from you know you know the streets of the Bronx and who just had this different view of reality and it was something the president had always said that he wanted in a Supreme Court justice was like approximation to reality and real people's lives and that that was such an important ingredient. All the constitutional stuff was really important, the academic credentials, the judicial credentials, which she had all, but what she had was that proximate reality. Um, and I think that, you know, as I look back at, at her opinions over the last almost 10 years now, and especially in this moment when we're, you know, fighting tooth and nail uh, to protect the Supreme Court, it really just reminds you how important it is to have people like her on the Supreme Court. I left DC because my mother was diagnosed with stage four breast cancer and she lived in Miami and I wanted to be a part of her life. I'd been gone for 20 years. So I don't write about that in the book, but uh, so I left to, to, for personal and family reasons, never regretted it, even though I kind of left at what that time was the peak of my career. But you know, every family decides those things for themselves. Everyone in this room has, has faced that or will face that and what you're willing to give up for your family. So I made that decision and left my job as the head of the National Network to End Domestic Violence. But because I went back to work at the local and state level after doing national work, uh, when it came time uh, for Joe Biden to, to reach out to me, I had a very good experience of work at the local level that I was able to bring. So he was much more interested in our interview in the West Wing. He was much more interested in what I had done in Florida and New Mexico than what I had done in DC previously because that told him that I had experience on the front lines. So he asked me, story, what are, what are survivors of violence and what are advocates facing in a local shelter program was much more interesting to him than whatever the battle in Congress had been right before I left DC. Um, and Gautam, coming back to you, so you're the Associate Director of Public Engagement under President Obama. Could you tell us exactly what that means and also some of your proudest accomplishments? Sure. So, uh, you know, one of the things that very early in the in the Obama White House, uh, and Stephanie was there for, for a lot of this, is the it, this office used to be called the Office of Public Liaison. In fact, it's now called that again. That's <laughs> apparently the, the Republican... <laughs> preference is to call it that. Um, but there was a very active effort to, to rename it the Office of Public Engagement, right? To really, as we would talk about it, be the front door to the White House for communities around the country. And so this was, you know, Valerie Jarrett Shop. She's senior advisor to president, a longtime friend and mentor of uh, both President and Mrs. Obama. And so we, in a lot of ways, it elevated the importance of this office and its function, which was to hear from, from every community. So um, each of us had our own portfolios. You know, there was like a team of about, you know, what, 20 of us, 20 of us or so? Um, with our, our own portfolios, whether it was, you know, as I had the, uh, with the LGBTQ community and the Asian American community, there's Latino, African American, Native American, um, and then, of course, you know, other communities like veterans, um, the Jewish American community, Muslim American community, women, women basically every, every, every part of America was somehow represented in this office. And so, you know, most of us saw our jobs as, as basically having two functions, right? One was to be a voice for the president to these communities. So to be able to tell, for example, LGBTQ community leaders why the Jobs Act matters to them, which on the surface, it may not feel like it does. Uh, and then the, the second part was to be a voice for those communities, as, as Lynn was too, um, within the White House and within the decision-making apparatus. And this, this really goes back to what you were talking about earlier with Stephanie about the importance of, you know, we, we tend to get caught up in these buzzwords like, you know, uh, identity politics or diversity and inclusion, but it really is about what the, the positive impact of having representation and inclusion when you're making decisions, right? We used to say in the White House, people are a policy, which is meant to really encapsulate that idea, right? That, that when you have the broad experiences of Americans reflected in the decision-making process, you get better outcomes for them. Hope and change. Hope was a big you know, motto and theme of the Obama administration and actually also of the Santos administration. Um, in <laughs> fact, the speech that Bradley Whitford wrote for uh, Jimmy Smith declaring his, his candidacy was all about hope, as I'm sure you can probably all recite it verbatim. But um, yeah, so sorry, little tangent just to get the words Bradley Whitford into this conversation. Um, <laughs> 
Um, so, but also to get the word hope, which is where I was going. Um, and in fact, it's on the, it's on the cover. cover. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering when you are thinking about all the depressing things happening in the news, when you're meeting with people who have heartbreaking stories, when you're thinking about your hard work being under threat, where do you go to renew your hope? Is it whether that is to things in real life or to... Do you watch the worst way to, <laughs> to rev yourself up about? Is there certain music? Are there certain books? Where do you go to so that you feel like you can keep fighting another day? Uh, you start, Kevin. Uh, as I told you earlier, I was feeling so crappy earlier this week. I watched The Supremes. I'm like, oh, I'm just, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Glenn Close. He is not Christopher Mulready, though, I'll tell you that. No, he's um, not. <laughs> you know, so w w like, a lot of this actually, writing. Writing and editing and putting this book together has been, weirdly enough, a hopeful exercise. And I say weirdly because it started off as a very nostalgic thing, right? We were feeling bad, we were feeling sad, we were feeling like we were losing something. Yeah. Um, but at the when it's when it's all said and done, um, you know, I try to remind myself all the time that we we never stop being the country that elected Barack Obama twice, right? So. Those people are still out there. Those voters are still out there. It's still a thing that happened in big ways. Um, and all the people who are in this book and, and the hundreds, the thousands of people who are not in this book who campaigned for him, knocked on doors, who worked in the administration, like we didn't go anywhere either, right? So there are still people out there who care deeply about this country, about our democratic norms, about patriotism, and like all this idealism that we just don't see or talk about anymore. And they're making change in different ways. So whether it's in philanthropy, in the private sector, people running for office now, which is amazing. And I'll sort of end on that, which is I think one of the things that makes me very hopeful is seeing the enthusiasm and energy in the candidates out there, right? Because um, our, one of our former colleagues who's in this book, Michael Stratmanis, who has known the president and first lady for 30 years, um, he said something to me after the election, actually to a lot of us, and said, we had to stop um, asking Barack and Michelle Obama to save the world. Mm -hmm. um, the point being that they've done enough, right? Like, <laughs> give them a break. And so, uh, although it's nice to see him on the campaign trail and, and, and talking, just talking, oh my God, an adult talking, it's just so <laughs> refreshing. I mean, using words, um, complete sentences. Uh, even though that's, that's, it's so reassuring to want more of that, um, we have to find that leadership somewhere else. And if you look at just, I mean, the, the, some of the amazing, especially women of color who are running this cycle, who are just phenomenal. So I think that's where I find some hope, is just the, this new cohort of leadership that is answering <coughs> President Obama's call to service. The one last thing I will say, which is just a quick short plug outside of the book, but um, in January, another former colleague of mine, or of ours, and I are coming out with a podcast called Finding 46, which is about finding the 46th president, what it will take to beat Donald nice. Trump. <laughs> Um, so not ready for download yet, but keep an eye out for it um, because we are going to tackle the questions of what does it take to beat Donald Trump in, a, you know, in a in a presidential election? Is that the same as being a good president? And what are the other kind of lessons learned? We'll interview people like Gautam and Valerie Jarrett and others who are very familiar with both the campaign side of things, but also what it takes to run a good White House and what we'll have to do uh, in January 2020. Sounds 21. Great. Who they might like to see on the ticket in 2020. We'll have to Smith's. tune into Finding 46. <laughs> um, you know, I think, not to put Lynn on the spot here, but I think <laughs> I a right. Biden Harris ticket could be very cool. Yeah. Ah. Co sign, concur. <laughs> I'm in it. No, seriously, I totally agree. Can I please have a job as a speechwriter? I'm just going to ask that now. So. <laughs> I, I don't have any inside information about Joe Biden's plan. <laughs> You'll find out as soon as I do. I have to say I, I really enjoyed uh, Senator Klobuchar's work in the, this week and how strong she was in her questioning. And yeah. I, I think it was good for people to see what a strong member of the Senate she is. And, you know, I'm, I'm certainly a, in, in the camp of hoping for Joe Biden, but have no idea what will happen. Well, thank you so much thank for being with us. Thank you guys very much. This has been wonderful. Everybody buy the book if you haven't already. And the keynote lunch is starting snap slash has maybe already started um, <laughs> up upstairs.
do not know who the crazy conducting musicians up here are. My name is Ben. I'm Jerry. And we're your White House communication staff. We hope everyone's been having a fantastic weekend at the West Wing weekend. Have you? Three more days. Three. <laughs> Honestly, with some of the panels, some of the panels and the events and the wonderful people that we've met over the last uh, three days, we honestly could keep this going another three days. But we know you're tired, uh, Clay. So that just means we have to do this again next year, wink, wink. <clears throat> or the year after, wink, wink. Clay, <laughs> Clay's like literally passing out. <laughs> we're going to make West Wing Weekend 2020 banners. That's what we're going to do and <laughs> make it happen. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, before we get started, a couple of few things we just want to let you know. One, welcome to the keynote luncheon. We're glad to have you all here. We're going to get started in just a moment. Uh, at 3 o'clock, one of our very special events uh, coming up uh, today is the is the presentation of Isaac and Ishmael. That's going to be at 3 o'clock in the amphitheater or the White Oak Room? In the White Oak Room. Um, we're really, really excited to, for this. We've been waiting for this for a really long time, so we hope you guys come to that. Also, the closing ceremony will be at 5 p.m. also in the White Oak Room. It's going to feature a special performance from the Weekend Poofs. I love that name, by the way. It's brilliant. Um, and a few surprises as well. So we hope to see everyone there to, I won't say wrap up the West Wing weekend, but to, to wrap it up until what's next. Yeah. Now people are thinking you're going to actually rap again. Oh. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, exactly. We're very, <laughs> we are very excited for the keynote topic which is the cultural and historical significance of the West Wing. Um, our panelists today are uh, David Kuznet, who is the chief speechwriter for former President Clinton. Also professional male model. Uh, Gautam Raghavan, who is a former advisor to President Obama and liaison to the LGBT community, as well as the Asian and Pacific American community. Another former model. Uh, we've all, all, already spent an amazingly fun amount of time with these two lovely ladies, but from the series The West Wing, uh, Miss Kim Webster and Davika Parikh. And to form... <laughs> and to formally bring up all of our panelists and moderate the keynote today, please welcome to the stage entertainment journalist, author, and TV writer for the Washington Post, Mr. Zachary Pincus Roth. Kim, um, I was wondering if you could talk about just how you got to be on the West Wing and uh, got to have your role and sort of what was it like to be on the show in its heyday um, amid the reactions to the show. Uh, well, I've told this story several times, so forgive me if you've heard it before, but I was actually hired as a one-day background performer for the pilot. And, you know, over time, Aaron had been, it felt like maybe secretly auditioning me at cast read-throughs, like if a actor couldn't be there, for example, the first time was Elizabeth Moss. You may have heard of her. <laughs> uh, she couldn't be there, and so they asked me to come in and read her part for Crackpots and These Women, where her character was introduced. So I knew nothing about who Zoe was, other than she was Bartlett's daughter, she was in college, and a teenager. So I made some quick choices, because acting was my major in college, and, you know, yada, yada, yada. Seven years later, Ginger was there for it all. So um, I would also like to say that Devika and I are highly unqualified to be up here. <laughs> <laughs> Don't <And> tell them. <laughs> I have a feeling they're going to figure it out really quickly. <laughs> and I, too, Zach, would like to know, what was the second part of your question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just like, what was it like to be on the show in its heyday? What sort of reactions did you get? Um, and, and what was it like to yeah, be on a, a hit show about politics that was sort of shaping uh, people's ideas of politics? I mean, I knew from day one that this was going to be huge. I just knew it, you felt it, uh, and we were working with the best of the best. 
So every single day I was so grateful. We would never hang out in our trailers like actors do on most shows. We sat there on stage and watched these phenomenal performers bring this show to life. I felt like I worked in the White House. Like, I really did. The sets were so, so amazing. Unless you looked at the ceiling, which was all like stage lights, <laughs> you really felt like you were there. Um, you know, and this was at a, at a time before social media uh, and before like TMZ and all these other blogs. So I think we got off pretty easy. Um, but I remember being in New York with my brother, like going to TRL, and someone in line was like, oh my God, that's Ginger. And my brother's like, how the hell do they know that? <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, like this is real. Because I mean, you know, we're, I told you guys yesterday, I was basically the door whore of the West Wing, just standing in doorways saying, you know, like taking orders for popcorn and whatnot. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, like, I really didn't expect, you know, to be recognized. And sometimes, you know, 20 year olds will come up to me and be like, oh, my teacher used to make me watch your show in government class. And I was like, well, A, bite me, <laughs> and B, oh, that's cool. So yeah, I mean, I think we knew we, knew we were in, in a very special place, and uh, it was a real family environment, and I'm very, very grateful for every minute. And Devika, same question, how did you get your role, and um, what was it like to kind of be on the show Thank you for giving me an easy question. <laughs> and unlike him, I'm gonna pretend like I fit in up here. <laughs> Um, I, I actually auditioned for it, and it was funny because um, it was one line. <laughs> and back then, when I was auditioning, when I first got out to LA, you, they didn't email you scripts. You had to go pick a script up. So I called my agent, I said, oh, you know, I really want a script sent to my house so I can read it. They said, you're auditioning for one line. We're not gonna do that. We're not gonna waste paper doing that. I was like, fine, I'll come to the office. And as I sat there and read it, I was like, wow, this is really good. The writing, the, the, everything about it was just so excellent. So I went, I did all my actor stuff and wrote my little bio <laughs> for one line. <laughs> and then when I got to the audition, I saw a lot of my girlfriends, because in LA and New York, I'm sure when you're auditioning in a certain age range, certain ethnicity, you see the same people over and over. And as the years go on, sometimes some of those people drop away, they do other things, but every good, African-American actress was there. I was like, ooh, wow, she's here, she's here. So when I went and I had all this stuff planned and when I walked in the door, Aaron Sorkin was there. I went to Syracuse University. He's, he's a big supporter of, he's a Syracuse alumni. He didn't know that when they brought me in. Um, and I had to say this line and I remember I was thinking, okay, I'm gonna you know, do like a walk and talk and I'm gonna pull the pencil from behind my ear and write stuff down. So they, you know, they're saying the script and then I go get to my line and I'm like this. <laughs> and the pencil got stuck in my ear. I was like, oh gosh. Oh. And then I tried to write it down. And I walked out the door and I went, oh my gosh, I sucked. I had one line and I couldn't get it out. I was so embarrassed. I was like, oh my gosh. And driving home, I kept saying the one line. Should I get everybody in? Should I get everybody in? Should I get everybody in? <laughs> And this, this is what actors do. We drive home and we just go, oh, I should have done this. I practiced it that way. What happened? And I'm driving home going, oh my gosh, I suck. I mean, that's so embarrassing. And then like maybe a day later, I got a call and they're like, okay, they, you know, you're going to be hired for the West Wing. I said, really? I was like, I'm like, yay. I was should so I get everybody in? <laughs> <laughs> so I got a coach to help. Okay. So then the one line turned into a nine day shoot. I was there, they put me in some other scenes, but I still just had that one line. After the pilot aired, and we all knew it was really special. We just knew from reading it, we knew from the first table read, I, you all probably know this, when they do a show, we sit down with all the other actors at the table, we, we read through the script, the writers go back and rewrite, you know, they cut things, they edit things, they do things to make it work better. And then we, get, we keep getting new drafts of it while we're shooting. So. You know, after the first shoot, you know, they didn't call me for a couple of weeks. And then after maybe they did the third or fourth episode, they called my agent and said, we'd like to recur her. And I was like, oh, which means ongoing work on the show. And I was, I, was just, I was just so grateful because it was such a good show. And I was telling them this yesterday. I had done nothing but uh, comedy up to that point. I was doing a lot of sketch comedy and improv. 
And so I was doing a lot of sitcom work. So to get a one hour drama that was still witty and funny, but a one hour drama on a show with a really multi-dimensional aspect, I was really excited. That was one of my questions I wanted to ask at some point. I mean, you know, people have talked about how the show has been criticized for having this sort of very white male uh, cast and perspective. And, um, you know, I've talked about, uh, you know, had critiques of some of the way the female characters have been portrayed and Josh and Donna, relationship and things like that. Um, I mean, how do you, uh, I guess to what extent do you as performers or even you guys as viewers feel that way about the show? And yeah, how might you feel like the show would be done differently now? Well, I would like to say that the redheaded community was really represented and we're only 2% of the whole world. So we were really represented, but everyone else, maybe not so much. <laughs> Um, wait, what was the question again? <laughs> Just sort of, um, I mean, basically, like, to what extent do you agree with sort of critiques of the show in terms of representation, and uh, you know, do you, to what extent will the show be very different today? It, I think it, I agreed with what you said. I think it would be very different, especially after having Obama in office. That something that you never, like, you know, my mother, they would have never expected that. My mom uh, was African American. My father was East Indian. Both of them have passed, but. My mother would have, you know, that type of thing, like to see an African American in office who's proud to be that, you know, changes so much for so, and gives so much hope to people of all, I think all ethnicities, that you really can do the, what you think might be impossible or what we tell ourselves, that's just never gonna happen in my lifetime. It's so inspirational, whether you agree with Obama or not, you know? But I agree with what he said that, that now, if they, we did this show today, you would see a huge minority presence in that White House. You know, they did bring on a lot of guest stars that were African American and other, and other races and Native American and Hispanic. But the main staffers, I think that I think that would make a huge difference. And with Jimmy Smith coming on, you know, later, I think that was the beginning of that change. Right. And if the show had kept going, I think that we would have seen more of that. And I don't know if it's, you know, life imitating art or art exactly. imitating right. life, but when Obama was elected, I was like, oh my gosh, this really is like, <laughs> first Sanchez. Jimmy Smith and now Obama? Like, <laughs> what's next? Get it? Uh, a redheaded president. <laughs> I had my tickets too this weekend, about 15 seconds after I saw it advertised in the city paper. So thank you for that ad, I appreciate that. And I was just wondering, when you heard about this weekend, like what was your reaction to hearing that this was going on? <laughs> Including the moderator. What year is it? <laughs> that was basically, I felt like I've been in a, like a coma for a dozen years. And I was like, I was on a TV show, I don't even remember. It was a long time ago, and I was like, do I remember the episodes? Like, what happened? <laughs> Some of those questions come to my mind, like, did we do that? Yes, Davika, um, we did. <laughs> we were there. Um, but I think, yeah, I think because, like Kim was saying, it's, it, was so, it was such a long time ago, but the more I've been here, like, this weekend, the more I go, oh, yeah, that's right, that did happen. I did feel like that. That was, you know, I had to really process it, because I was a little, like, concerned that I wouldn't remember a lot of stuff. But I always remember the experience and the significance at the time, like what it meant to my career as an actress and also just, just the value of the show itself. The, ec the level of excellence and what Aaron Sorkin was able to bring to TV and really affect a lot of people with well, is la long lasting, it's not gonna, it's a legacy, yeah. And despite it being a dozen years ago and being surprised that you guys wanted to do this, we're absolutely thrilled. And it's been an amazing week and I'm going to need a week vacation just to recover from smiling so much. Yeah, it's an I mean, honor. I was surprised, but also not, because I, I mean, I, I, almost was, I almost was also surprised, like, oh, how come there hasn't been something like this before? And I also had gone to the one of the West Wing Weekly tapings um, in DC and just sort of seeing the sort of, uh, almost like the very, you know, the fervor among the fans there, both in the audience and, you know, in the lobby before and after, I was sort of like, all right, yeah, this totally makes sense that this would happen, so. 
I was actually with, um, with Melissa Fitzgerald and Richard Schiff at a political fundraiser when she told me about it because um, I'm making a plug for my book. So I just edited a book that's a collection of stories from the Obama White House called West Wingers, obviously, <laughs> um, which came out last Tuesday. And so I was telling her about the book and she was like, you have to come to this weekend. I'm like, what, what? And then she's like, it's in Bethesda. I'm like, oh my God, I have to be there. So I reached out to Claire, I was like, please, like, can I come? <laughs> so um, I think, it's, I can't believe this is the first time it's happening. Yeah, yeah, like, same. Not the last. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Just a lot of these kids with you? Uh, yeah, I guess they are. Extremists is to Islamic as KKK is to Christianity. That's, that's about right. That's a good religious analogy. What's the political analogy? What's an analogy using governments? They don't have a government. They have the Taliban. They have the government of Afghanistan. The Taliban is not the recognized government of Afghanistan. The Taliban took over the recognized government of Afghanistan. And there's your political analogy. What do you mean? When you think of Afghanistan, think of Poland. When you think of the Taliban, think of the Nazis. When you think of the citizens of Afghanistan, think of the Jews in the concentration camps. A friend of my dad's was at the house, and was at one of the camps. And he used to come over to the house. And he and my dad used to play some pinochle. He said he once saw a guy at the camp kneeling and praying. He said, what are you doing? The guy said, he was thanking God, and my dad's friend said, what could you possibly be thanking God for? He said, I'm thanking God for not making me like them. Bad people can't be recognized on sight. There's no point in trying. Actually, we've already covered that. It's worth covering twice, won't you agree? <laughs> I do. Can I go back to what you were saying at the beginning? Yeah. About it being 100% ineffective? Yeah. They're still doing it anyway. Yeah. They're not frustrated by the failure? No. Well, what do you call a society that has to just live every day with the idea that the pizza place they're eating in can just blow up without any warning? It's red. Look, I take civil liberties as seriously as anybody, okay? I've been to the dinners, and we haven't even talked about free speech yet or somebody getting lynched by the patriotism police for voicing a minority opinion. That said, Tobis, we're going to have to do some stuff. We're going to have to tap some phones, and we're going to have to partner with people who are the lesser of evils. I'm sorry, but terrorists don't have armies and navies. They don't have capitals. Some of these guys, we're going to have to walk up to them and shoot them. We can root out terrorist nests, but some of these guys are not going to be taken by the 105th Armored Tank Division. Some of these guys are going to be taken by a busboy with a silencer. So it's time to give the intelligence agencies the money and the manpower they deserve. We never hear about their successes. Guess what? The Soviets never crossed the Elbe. The North Koreans stayed behind the 38th parallel. During the millennium, not one incident. You think the terrorists thought that'd be a good day to take off? Not much happening that day? End of song. It's the same as it is here. I live in Southeast DC. If you're not familiar with the area, think Compton or South Central Los Angeles, Detroit, the South Bronx, dilapidated schools, drugs, guns, and what else? Gangs. Gangs. Gangs give you a sense of belonging and usually an income. But mostly they give you a sense of dignity. Dignity. Men are men and men will seek pride. Everybody here's got a badge to wear. I'm communications director, deputy communications director. I'm a presidential classroom. I know the answer. I'm going to Cornell. You think bangers are walking around with their heads held down saying, man, I didn't make anything out of my life. I'm in a gang. No, man, they're walking around saying, I'm in a gang. I'm with them. Well, all right, that's it then. Can I ask one more question? Yeah. Do you favor the death penalty? No. But you think we should kill these people? You don't have the decisions in a war that you do in a jury room. But I, I, I wish we didn't have to. I think death is too simple. What would you do? 
I put them in a small cell and make them watch home movies of the birthdays and baptisms and weddings of every single person they killed. Over and over, every day, for the rest of their lives. And then they'd get punched in the mouth every night at bedtime. <laughs> by a different person every night. There'd be a long list of volunteers, but that's okay. We'll wait. <laughs> but listen, don't worry about all of this right now. We got you covered. Worry about school, worry about what you're going to tell your parents when you break curfew. You're going to meet guys, you're going to meet girls. Not so much you, Fred. <laughs> Learn things. Be good to each other. Read the newspapers, go to movies, go to a party, read a book. In the meantime, remember pluralism. Keep, you want to get these people? I mean, you really want to just reach in and kill them where they live? Keep accepting more than one idea. Makes them absolutely crazy. Go. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. It was, uh, it was fun. <laughs> Don't steal anything on your way out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Billy. Yeah? Listen. Um, nothing. Just, just keep doing what you're doing. Okay. There's something happening here But it is ain't exactly clear There's a man with a gun over there Telling me I got to beware Think it's time to stop, children, what's that sound? Everybody look what's going on Kat was my counselor teacher at uh, camp, at my summer camp, and it was her, they do a one-act festival every session, and it was her idea to, for me to adapt Isaac and Ishmael, because it is essentially a one-act play. I love um, it when people do what I tell them. And, <laughs> um, me too, and uh, so the first version of this um, was completely stripped down, so all the, the Josh and his mom and Rosalind bits were cut out and Toby's whole first funny monologue was cut out and um, basically anything that wasn't directly related to the message that wasn't Sorkin essentially speechifying through these characters was <laughs> whacked out like, immediately. So there's also, I mean, still a lot of stuff missing that I, I cut out for this, but um, the whole Leo plot for one thing was, that was, at first I did, I struggled with whether or not to keep that because I think for a lot of us it was weird to see Leo acting like that, but for an audience who doesn't know the West Wing, they wouldn't know any different. It would just be a completely different character. Um, but uh, I think I, I decided to hack it, one, for time, and two, because it's a little, not on the nose, but with everything else going on in this scene, I mean, it creates such a, such an, a deep environment when you just stay in this one area where it goes throughout the day and there, the message is much more upfront. Um, you don't really need the subplot when you have this continuous message, which you can do on a stage when you don't need a subplot for TV. I have a question. Yeah. So you perform this at the camp? Mm-hmm. How was, so the audience, I imagine, we all know the West Wing. We all know this. What was the reaction of an audience that had no idea? So, um, <laughs> so imagine, if you will, a uh, barn. Um, a sweaty, hot barn in the middle of August. Most uncomfortable, um, seats, most uncomfortable ever. seats ever, crooked. Um, and the actors were ages 13 to 17, or 16 actually, I think was our oldest kid. And um, the audience was all like, you know, seven to 17 kids and then their counselors many of whom are international um, people who had not seen the West Wing. 
So I guess I, I don't know if I was being pessimistic. I didn't expect it to go over super well, especially because in this one act festival, generally it's funnier, light pieces, like fluffy things for younger. It's the one acts are really for younger kids who don't get huge parts in the shows at this theater camp. Um, and so then it was like, there was one that was like set to David Bowie music. And there was one that was about like, um, you know, comedies and statues in Greek or something, and then this. Um, <laughs> and uh, I think a lot of people didn't really know what to think at first, but I ended up, I mean, by the time when S Sam's bit came around, um, my wonderful friend Allison was playing Sam. I just want to give her a shout out, even though she's not here. Um, and I, people were so, and I, I was sitting in the way back, so I could not see at all how the audience was reacting. Okay. But she could. They were riveted. Yeah. I mean, like, riveted. <laughs> and when, when he said, Israel, the lights went out, and you just heard a, mur a low murmur of, oh, damn. <laughs> <laughs> and my, my co-director and I were sitting in the back, and the lights, the lights went out. I took a video of this, and right when the lights got, he goes, pin drop. Because he's British. And, he was, yeah. oh. and we were so excited, because it was, that's how I knew that it, it went over well, because... The mess, I mean, honestly, it was my, my co-director's idea. I was so in West Wing brain, um, and he had never seen an episode, and that helped so much because he just stripped away everything, um, which is what you need when it's, when it's going to be a play. The message is the most important thing, and that's, that remains. When you take out all the, all the extra character bits and the, the, the context, it, that's the most important thing. And like Kat said, I mean, the, it's, the writing is so strong and the message is so strong that it, it doesn't matter if you don't have the character context. Everybody was yeah. so invested and that was just so cool to see. to the closing ceremony of the West Wing Weekend. Yes. I'm, I'm, sorry, I'm, I'm Jerry. I'm Ben. And we're your White House communication staff. Yeah. <laughs> One of the closing panels to this convention was, what does the West Wing mean to you? And uh, I can't stop thinking about what the West Wing Weekend has meant to me. As your host this weekend, there's been a lot of running around, introducing panels, and trying to make this as fun as possible for everyone. And these were things that we knew getting into it, and that we missed a lot of stuff. <laughs> what we didn't know and what we couldn't anticipate was how truly amazing and inspiring the people who we would meet during this event would be. Yeah. Uh, this is, convention has truly had a little bit for everyone. Whether it was re-watching old episodes and then discussing them afterwards, whether it was getting the chance to perform for all of you, um, <laughs> um, or the many, many participating in the many, many academic panels. We've both learned and laughed so much. I know uh, I'm not the only one who's walking away from this weekend with many new friends and uh, a new admiration for the usefulness of a walk and talk. Yeah. <laughs> we thought it was actually doing that a lot. <laughs> uh, I might not be looking over over a magnificent vista. <laughs> Although those paintings are kind of confusing in the back. <laughs> but uh, I am looking out over this, some of the most magnificent people that I've had the privilege of meeting. Um, and I don't know if there will ever be another West Wing weekend. I don't know if you want there to be another West Wing weekend. I'm calling Intent, it. wink, wink. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I do know that this weekend would not be possible without the unbelievably amazing, incredibly hardworking staff and volunteers. Yeah. Yeah. 
So we would like to personally say, as your host, Jerry and Ben, thank you. Thank you to our amazing guests. Thank you to our special guests. Thank you to all of our speakers. Thank you to everyone who ran a panel. Thank you to all of our volunteers. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you can clap, trust me. Um, and of course, many, many, many thank yous to our wonderful directors. I just realized you gave me the names again. <laughs> thank you to Claire. Thank you to Elisa. Thank you to Patricia. Thank you to Clay. Yeah. Woo! Thank you, thank you. Uh, and you know, Ben and I, we've done a lot of talking this weekend. <laughs> so much talking. So I think for now, we're gonna sign off and we're gonna bring up those amazing people. So ladies and gentlemen, the directors to your West Wing weekend.
everyone for coming out and for supporting and the smiles and the love and getting the opportunity to talk to so many people. Yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is now the official thing. When you see each other like, you know, across the subway platform, go, didn't I meet you at? <laughs> That's what we're going to do now. Um, but just getting to talk to so many people and see how many people's lives have been touched by the show from a dramatic standpoint, from a TV standpoint, and for me, um, also from a political and activist standpoint. Because I think a lot of us are going to walk away from this not just with, oh, we had a great time talking about the show or whatever, whatever, but I think a lot of us are going to go back especially with the midterms coming up in a couple of weeks, to be like, get off your ass and vote! You know? Decisions are made by those who show up! Um, and if we can take that and like, take it and just keep spreading it, then the next time we do this, I'm not going to say if, the next time we do this, whenever that may be, then it'll do just keep getting better. So thank, thank all of you and Clay to thank you so much. Thank you. So just one last time here. Thank you both. Um, thank you to everybody else. Thank you to everyone who, everyone who came, everyone who contributed, everyone who did anything here. Um, so everybody keeps asking that question about will there be another one. Those of us who were working on this need some time to kind of figure out where our brains are and where our... A bit of a bank account is and things like that, um, but it's certainly not something that's off the table. And I feel like the engagement and energy and passion that each of you has, both for this show, for this fandom, and for turning that into something in the real world, is something that should be continued to be tapped into. Whether I try to do it, whether this team tries to do it, whether one of you says, "Hey, I want to pick up that baton," however it happens, there should be another thing like this, 100%. Right? So, yes. <laughs>